All right, well, let's go ahead and let's turn in our Bibles to John chapter 6. And uh, I want to continue on the theme I've been focused on for several weeks. I don't know, six weeks. I don't even know how long it's been. Several weeks we've been looking at what is the Lord trying to do in this season where everything is being shaken, where the pandemic is hit. What is the Lord trying to get out of his church? And what is the Lord saying to his church? There's a lot of things that could be said, but... Uh, what I've been saying from the very beginning, one of the main things the Lord is wanting to do is he's wanting to change the church of trying to fit Jesus into our life to where Jesus now becomes our life. And we've done many different things from John chapter 6, and we've been focused on for several weeks now point number 6 about what Jesus was teaching us about living by his indwelling life is that living by his life begins when living from our life ends. And I did a whole sermon about the depravity of the flesh and the soul and how the soul needs to be crucified. And, and then I also real, talked about the, the, how believers really need to understand the condition of their born-again spirit. And so in the last message, I spent about, I don't know, I spent uh, you know, a whole hour going through three different things about your born-again spirit. And now in this message, I want to go through, I think we have three more, point number four, five, and six of what happened to your born-again spirit. This is so important. A lot of believers don't really understand what happened when they were born again, but when you're born again, it dramatically changed your life. And when you understand it, it gives you the power to go forward. And I want to start here reading in, in John chapter 6, verse 57. The, Lord, the Lord's speaking, and, and he makes an incredible statement about living by his indwelling life. As the Lord says, as the living Father sent me, and I live by the Father, so he who eats me, he also will live by me. And that's really the Lord's heart, is the Lord would want us to live by his indwelling life. I don't know if you've ever felt this way where you feel like you're on some kind of a spiritual treadmill and you're just you're taking two three steps forward and you're going two steps back and you feel like you're spinning your wheels and you're not going forward anywhere. I mean it could be any kind of a of a battle that you might face, pride, lust, fear, anxiety, where you feel like, okay, I take three steps forward, but then I go two steps back, and I never make, or that, that actually is progress. I take two steps forward, but then three steps back, and I never make any progress. Forgot how to do math. So anyway, you know, if you ever feel that way, where you're, you can't seem to get off that treadmill, when we understand the condition of our spirit, what that does is it gives us traction. It gives us traction. And it reminds me of a time when Anna was four. We call it the stuck road. And what happened was we were, me and Angie and Anna were at Zaxby's and we were eating. And, you know, the, you could tell the sun was setting soon. And Angie, who I need to listen to more, she was like, I think we really need to leave now because you, you don't know what the mountain roads are going to be like. You know, and I, you know, this self-confident driver said, hey, just relax. It'll be fine. You're, you're freaking out over something. You don't need to worry about it. And finally, I, we got up and left, and we're driving up this gravel steep road, and all of a sudden, we lose traction. And our wheels start spinning, and everyone in the car is freaking out. And uh, anyway, I was thinking, okay, we're going to be stuck on this road. With, I mean, we can't even get up here. What are we going to do? Thankfully, a guy drove by, and he had been up the road many times, so he drove our car up to the mountain road, and we got back safely. But after that time, Anna was like, Dad, you are not, Dad, well, she was four. She's like, Daddy, no stuck road. You are not driving on the stuck road. And so she always made Angie's dad drive on the stuck road. And to this day, if you say Anna stuck road, her, her palms get sweaty, her heart starts beating fast, and she's looking at me like, yeah, that's not true. I'm just I'm kidding. But a lot of times, you know, that was also the, you know, a lot of times is we're trying to gain traction. We're trying to go forward. We're trying to make progress in the Lord. But if we don't know and we don't understand the condition of our born-again spirit, if we don't know what the Lord has done when we were born again, 
then what happens is we begin to spin our wheels. We, there's, there's nothing that can get traction. There's nothing that can bear down in the dirt and allow us to go forward because if all we know is the condition of our flesh, if all we know is the, the condition of the sin in our body, if all we know is the condition of our soul, we never can go forward in the Lord. We can never get the traction we need to make progress in the Lord. And so what I want to do in this message is talk about gaining traction by understanding the condition of our born-again spirit. In the last message, I talked about there, there's, there are, our spirit is born again. Our spirit is regenerated. Our spirit is alive from the dead. We have resurrection life. I said one of the things I, I could tell, just it was a light bulb went off in, in many people's minds, is you are one-third of the way to salvation. One-third complete is, is the way I would phrase it is your spirit is righteous. That right there is a complete shift in the way we think because we're always striving to try to become something or try to do something. But when you realize in when, when Jesus Christ saved you, when the spirit of God came inside of you and recreated your spirit, he, he recreated your spirit in, an, in a place of righteousness, in a place of holiness, Ephesians 4.24, your spirit, one-third of you is righteous. And that, doesn't that change your perspective? As you're not just a sinner saved by grace. You are a saint. You are a holy one. Your spirit is righteous. Your spirit is holy. Your spirit is complete. One-third of you, has already, the, the work has already been finished in one-third of your being. That is amazing. That, that changes everything. That is like, that sounds almost too good to be true. But when we have a revelation of that, it gives us the, 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 the traction to live by, the traction to make progress. It changes us. It, it has changed my life dramatically. Paul said, if Christ is in you, that's the big if. If you truly have Jesus Christ in you, the uncreated God, the eternal Son of God, who by the Spirit created the universe, if he lives inside of you, Paul said in Romans 8.10, he says, your spirit is alive because of righteousness. Your spirit is alive. Your spirit is not dead. Your spirit is not wicked. Your spirit is not depraved. Now, your soul, your flesh, we'll say it this way, is depraved. God has a remedy for that. But your spirit, one-third of you is righteous. One-third of you is holy. And so we looked a lot about that in the last message. And I want to continue on this theme. The, the fourth thing about your spirit is your spirit is Christ-like. Let's look at it here in Ephesians 4.24. I want you to see this because when you see it for yourself and it moves from being a message to being something you see with your own eyes, it changes you. If you just hear it from me and say, okay, well, Brian said that, that my spirit's righteous. Brian said my spirit's holy. Brian said, you know, my spirit's Christ. Like that won't do much for you. But when you see it in the word of God and that word becomes revelation to you, then your eyes are opened and then you are changed. Then you take ownership of it and that the seed of that word goes into you and is planted inside of you. Ephesians 4.24. It's the scripture we looked at last, in the last message. As Paul's talking about the new creation... And he says, put on the new self, put on the new man. And notice his language here, which in the likeness of God, I'm going to just say in the likeness of Christ, same thing. Notice the tense, has been created. It's finished. He's talking about your spirit. The past tense reality of this changes our life. See, when we see that, okay, this work has been completed. 
it changes everything. It is finished. The work, and I, there's a lot to do in your soul, and there's a lot to do in your flesh. Now, we're not talking about that right now. We're talking about the condition of the spirit, the condition of your human spirit. Paul says, has been created. It's done. It is finished. It's completed. The work in your spirit when you are born again is done. And notice what he said. It's, it's been done in the likeness of God. And I'm just going to say in the likeness of Christ because we know God's ultimate intention is to conform us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. See, if you remember, we talked about in, the, in the, uh, the eternal blueprint teaching on God's eternal purpose that one of God's ultimate intentions is to conform us into the image of his beloved son. Do you realize... One-third of that work in you is done. That's incredible. One-third of his eternal plan and purpose to conform you into the image of his son is complete. That's incredible. Think about that for a second. Ponder that reality. One third of you is already Christ-like. I don't I mean it almost seems like it's it's too good to be true. It almost seems like it's not even real. It's true. It's real. It doesn't matter what you think or it doesn't matter how you feel about it. It doesn't matter what your soul says. It doesn't matter if your body what your body says. The truth of God's word, looking in the mirror, looking in the mirror of God's word, he says, your spirit, one third of you is already like Jesus Christ. Now, there, there's a lot you can say about, okay, why do I still have problems? Why do I still struggle with sin? There's a whole nother stuff we could teach about that, and we will sometime in the future. But what I'm drooling at is I want you to see in your mind, in, the, in, your, in your meditation, that your spirit is already like him. That gives you traction. That gives you the ability to put the wheels in the ground and move forward. That gives you the ability to make progress. If we don't know this, we are going to continually be spinning our wheels in the sand. We're going to be continually spinning our wheels in the dirt, not going anywhere in the Lord. But when you realize one third of me is already like him, that's, that is amazing. See, 1 John 4.17 says, As he is, so also are we in this world. It doesn't say, so also will we be in this world. It doesn't say, so also will we be in heaven. It says, so also are we in this world. See, that is, that is our condition right now of our spirit is we, our spirit is already like him right now in this world. See, so many Christians just think, well, only when I get to heaven, it is, it's going to be great. Only when, when I get to heaven, I'll be like him. When I, when I see him, I'll be like him and all that. Well, the reality is, is your spirit already is like him. And what I've found is I, if I want to become like him in my soul, in my heart, in my, more like him in my body, gaining that traction of knowing my spirit is already like him makes a profound difference. I'm not struggling and striving to become like Jesus where I try to model him and imitate him. Instead, 
my spirit, being like him, is now being released into my heart, into my soul, so that Christ's likeness begins to permeate every part of my being. It's a totally different way of thinking about that. This is not fake it until you make it self-help psychology. You know that new age stuff where you're trying to just, if you confess it long enough, you're eventually going to believe in it, even though it's not real. That is not it. This is what it is. I'm uncovering what God has already done in your, in your spirit. I'm taking the, the, the word of God and putting it up to your spirit and saying, this is what you look like. You, we don't know what we look like in our spirit. We can't tell what we look like in our spirit. We're as invisible. It's some, nothing we can touch, nothing we can put our finger on. But the word of God is a mirror, and the word of God tells us this is what your spirit is like. And when we look in the mirror and see what Jesus Christ has done in our spirit, we see our spirit is already like him. We are already like him in this world. That changes everything. That changes everything. See, we know the reality in, in when we look in the mirror. A physical mirror cannot lie, unfortunately. Neither does a spiritual mirror. That's the good news. The spiritual mirror of God's word does not lie, cannot lie. This is what you look like in the spirit. And that invisible part of you, deep within you, deep within your being, your spirit is already like him. Your spirit is already like Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you, don't just hear a message about that. Make that your regular meditation. You know, we've, we're, our, our brains are so wired with condemnation and unbelief and doubt and negativity that we almost have a hard time even believing what I'm saying right now. Well, that just shows you, you need to renew your mind. The issue we have right now is our thinking is not in alignment with God's word. Our thinking, see, God has done this finished work. You already are a multimillionaire, spiritually. Like we talked about in the last message, Ira Yates I mean, he had millions and millions of dollars underneath the ground, and he lived for 11 years without knowing it, and he lived in poverty. Your spirit is already like him. Your spirit is already like Jesus Christ. The issue is you don't know it. That's why we need to meditate often on God's word. That's why we need to renew our minds often with the word of God. The fifth point is your spirit already has everything you need. Let's look at 2 Peter 1.3. This is such good news. This is the gospel. I mean, incredible. Peter's writing and he says, seeing that his divine power has granted, I'm just going to say has given, That's, I like that better, that's basically the same meaning, seeing that his divine power has given to us, I want you to notice again, this is past tense, this is already accomplished, not something that's going to happen. His divine power has given to us everything, everything, everything pertaining to life and godliness. You already have everything you need to become like Jesus Christ in your spirit. I'm not, that's almost, hard to, almost impossible to believe, isn't it? His divine power has given to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. You already have it inside of you. you are, because you already have him inside of you. 
Because Jesus Christ lives inside of us by his spirit, we have everything we need for life and godliness. See, so many Christians are looking up to heaven and crying out to God, do this in me, do that in me. As if God's going to drop it down to them from heaven. He's not going to drop it down to you from heaven. He's going to release it inward into your soul, to your heart. It's already there. It's like, you know, the, the pipe that connects our water supply. You know, whenever, whenever it's getting cold, you turn the water supply off in your basement and not cuts off the water supply outside so your pipes don't freeze. Is you know, our, the way ours is, ours is, is you just take a lever or the little whatever that lever, lever, whatever, and switch it down, and then that causes, or no, you switch it up. Yeah, you can tell I'm not really mechanical. Actually, Angie does that. No, I'm kidding. But you, you, turn it, you turn it to cut the water supply off. You turn it up, and to bring the water supply down, you bring it down so it's, you know, in, in alignment with the pipe. That's the way our connection is with Jesus Christ in the Spirit is when, when, our soul is in live, when our soul is living, we've cut off the water supply of Jesus Christ from our spirit. But when our soul, when we meditate and we come into alignment with the, every good thing that Jesus has already done inside of us, like we talked about in the last message from Philemon, when we talk about what Philemon said, meditate or acknowledge every good thing in you because of Jesus Christ. When we meditate on that, when we think about that, that releases the supply of God's life upward into our heart and our soul, eventually out into our body. You already have everything you need for life and godliness. So many Christians live in poverty, struggling with anxiety and doubt, depression, lust, anger, covetousness, you know, you can name it, whatever, selfishness, doubt, unbelief, you can, whatever it is, jealousy, envy, you know, whatever it is, low self-esteem, they live, they live lives of torment waiting for God to pour out something from heaven on them to change them, not knowing the solution and the answer is already in them because Jesus is in them by the Spirit. You already have everything you need for life and godliness. The issue is not getting it. The issue is releasing it. The issue is knowing it. The issue is meditating on it. The issue is tapping into what God's already done in your spirit. I'm convinced... You know, so much of the church today is crying out for a revival, and I'm all for that, obviously. You know, they spend hours and hours and hours praying for revival, praying for revival, and I am all for that. If you want to pray for revival, that's, that's fine. I mean, and I believe there's coming a revival, but I just want to seriously ask, what would happen if those who had Jesus Christ already inside of them meditated on the truth every day, 15 to 30 minutes a day, of the condition of their spirit, that they already have everything for life and godliness, and began to live by that, I think we would have the revival that we've been praying for. That's just my opinion. I'm not saying don't pray for revival. I'm trying to stress to us the importance of meditation. If we will meditate on Christ in us, on every good thing because of Jesus Christ, if we will meditate on him and what he's done in our spirit, our li and I'm saying this from experience, your life will be transformed. I mean, if you're tired of struggling, if you're tired of spinning your wheels, if you're tired of being in the same place without making spiritual progress, I'm telling you, look in the mirror at your spirit. You already have what you need. You already have everything you need for life and godliness. You already have, because Jesus Christ is in you, you already have love. You already have joy. 
You already have peace. You already have meekness. You already have faith. All the fruits of the Spirit are already inside of you. You already have the mind of Jesus Christ. You already have his faith already inside of you. I used to spend hours praying, God, give me more love. Give me more humility. Give me more this. Give me more that. You know, the, the attributes of Christ until I realized, wait, I already have it. it the, the problem is it hasn't been released into my heart and my soul. I was waiting for God to drop it down upon me from heaven when God was wanting me to look inward to Christ and where he dwells and let his life then fl uh, flow out of me from uh, my heart into my soul into my body. It's a totally different way of thinking, but when you see it, your life changes. It's like the, the light goes on, and, and what I'm saying here, this has been probably the most uh, dramatic thing that has changed my life is the revelation of what I'm talking about. If you can get this, what I'm talking about, if you can understand this, if, if you really go deep in it, not just hearing a message about it, not just, you know, hearing about it, thinking about it, good message, whatever, and then forgetting about it, but if you will meditate on it, if you will think about it, if you will incorporate it into your prayer life, into your vocabulary, with the Lord, you will, it'll change you because you already have it. You already have him. You have him. The very one who raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of you. The very one who created the universe at the command of God lives inside of you. The very one who impregnated Mary lives inside of you. And he's already made one-third of your spirit complete, righteous, holy, He's already made one-third of your spirit just like him. You already have everything inside of you for life and godliness. The issue is tapping into it and thinking about it. Number six, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. Your spirit is already one with Christ. Your spirit is already one with Christ. Do you ever struggle feeling like God is a million miles away? Do you ever struggle feeling dead, dry, or disconnected? I know I've said it a lot, so many times, and the Lord's correcting me. How are you doing? I, I'm okay. I just feel a million miles away from the Lord. How are you doing? I feel dead and dry and disconnected. That's not true. What, why, what I was doing, what we do when we make statements like that, is we are describing our feelings. We're describing our soul. We are basically saying, how are you doing? You're basically saying, well, my soul is in dominion because I feel disconnected or I feel a million miles away or I feel dry and dead. No, that is your soul. Your soul with its feelings is lying to you and you're listening and you're obeying. You are not what you feel like. I mean, that's a dramatic change right there. And I've had to, you know, I wrote this this week. I've had to catch myself, I don't know, 10 times or so going, man, I feel dead, I feel dry, I feel this, I feel that. No. Your spirit is one with him already. You cannot get any closer to him in your spirit. Think about that. That is amazing. Look at what Paul said here. The one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. I want to read it again. Just read it in your, in your, in your Bible. Just get this in your thought pattern. 
The one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. This is the way I think about it. When we go to Africa, we always, our, our, our life supply is via Starbucks Coffee Columbia Blend because you just never know where you're going to be. You really never know where you're going to be in Africa. And if you don't have coffee, you just are not going to survive. So we always know that via Starbucks Columbia Blend, instant coffee is the remedy to keep us alive spiritually. And so we take these VIA packets, and uh, I normally don't even like Starbucks. I, to me, it's kind of like a dead skunk. But anyway, but when, you're, when you don't have anything else, it's better. Hopefully, I didn't offend any Starbucks drinkers. But when, you, when that's all you have, you know, it's the best thing you can possibly have. But we take VIA, and we take sugar, and we take coffee mate creamer, and we take boiling water, and we take those things, and we pour them into a cup, and then those four ingredients become one. And then after that, you cannot separate the via from the coffee mate, from the sugar, from the boiling water. They are now one. That's the way your born-again spirit is like, inseparable from Christ. You are one spirit with him. That's incredible. When Paul's talking here, he's, he's using the analogy of marriage. He says the one who joins himself to the Lord, that word joins is coming directly from Genesis. And uh, let's see, Genesis 4.24 or 3.24, 2.24? Got it in my notes. It's the, the famous marriage scripture, 2.24, Genesis 2.24. Paul is directly quoting that here in 1 Corinthians 6.17. He's saying the same way that a husband and wife, a man and a woman, leave their father and mother and are joined together as one flesh, cleaving together, together, that is the way your spirit is with the spirit of Jesus Christ. One with him. Joined together with him. Think about that. That means you no longer have to struggle with intimacy with the Lord. The issue is not him, it's you. I'm not saying that, amen. I'm not saying that there's not a need for repentance. <laughs> I'm not saying there's not a need for repentance. I'm not saying there's not a need to, to for, I'm not saying any of that. But the issue is we're believing our feelings more than we are believing the word of God. We're believing the lie that says, I am a million miles away from the Lord. We're believing the lie that says, I am disconnected, I am dry, I'm dead. No, you are not. That's your soul and its feelings lying to you, mixed in with the devil and his accusations. You are not a million miles away from the Lord. You couldn't be closer to the Lord. He's closer than your skin. You are one spirit with him. You are joined together spirit to spirit with him. The indwelling Holy Spirit and your spirit are one. Inseparable. That means you can come inwardly to him at any moment and experience intimacy with him at all times. You can walk in an intimate relationship with him like you never dreamed of. You can go deep in the Lord in, in a way that no one has ever gone before. That's possible. The problem is, do we want that enough? Do we hungry for him that much that we will go deeply here into our spirit because your spirit is one with him? Your connection to him is one spirit. One spirit with him. This, this Greek word for join means glued. It means glued together. Your spirit has been glued together with the spirit of Jesus Christ. It reminds me of... I got a piece of, two pieces of construction paper. Thanks to my daughter, Anna, for the uh, sermon illustration here. 
I've got a red piece of construction paper representing the spirit of Jesus Christ. We had green, but I representing life, but I forgot it at home, so she did it here. And we've got our spirit in the white. And she took glue and, and glued together the two pieces of construction paper. This is the way your spirit looks with him. You are glued together. You can't be separated. You are glued together as one spirit with him. Well, then why do I struggle? Why do I still have these mind battles? Why do I still have these battles with the flesh? Why do I struggle with this and struggle with that? It's as simple as your meditation. You've been thinking about the wrong thing. Your mind is still hardwired under the old Adamic nature. You have not been meditating on the truth of the condition of your born-again spirit. You are glued together with the spirit of Jesus Christ. You can't be separated. You're one spirit with him. I think it's for this reason the Lord told his disciples, it is to your advantage that I go away. Can you imagine that? The Lord walking three and a half years in the flesh. Any one of us would have said, oh, I would die to do that. I would, that would be the most incredible experience and yet Jesus looks at them and he says, it is to your advantage if I go away. It's better if I go away. Well, really? Are you serious, Lord? We love walking with you. We love seeing the miracles. We love seeing the dead raised. We love seeing the demons cast out. We love hearing you teach. It is better if I go away because if I don't go away, I will not send the Holy Spirit to you. And he will come and he will live in you. I think he's talking just exactly of this reality of what we've been talking about, the, the union of your spirit to his spirit. That union was made possible because of the cross. That union was made possible because Jesus went away. That's amazing. We, we've, got some, we, we've got an incredible treasure inside of us. We've got such an incredible wealth inside of us we are one spirit with him. We are glued together, fastened together, cemented together. That's what all that word means, with the Lord, just like a husband and wife. That is what our union with Jesus, spirit to spirit, is like. Paul goes on. Let's look at uh, Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. And Paul's going through here, and he's basically talking about the law and our death to the law. I'm going to read it here. As Paul is saying, Do you not know, brethren, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law has juris jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives? For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. So then, if while the husband is living, uh, she is joined to another man, same concept we've been talking about, she should be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. And here's really his point. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law, the external commandment saying, you must do this and you must do that. You must do this and you must do that. Those external commandments, those 613 commandments contained in the law of Moses, you died to having to fulfill those in your own flesh and in your own power. In the body of Jesus Christ, you died to that. And here, here's what he's getting at. So that you might be joined to another. It's the same joining we've been talking about in 1 Corinthians 6, 17. The spirit-to-spirit -spirit joining with Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. 
so that you might be joined to him, to the indwelling spirit, to the spirit of life in Jesus Christ, that you might be joined to him. You died to the other things for spiritual union with Jesus Christ. To him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. You cannot bear fruit from God or bear fruit for God in the flesh. You cannot bear fruit for God in the soul. You cannot bear fruit for God by struggling and striving with teeth gritted to obey the commandments of the law. You cannot bear fruit for God by just externally clenching your fist with willpower and determination saying, I am going to do it. Fruit only comes as the byproduct of intimacy with him. If you abide in me and, my, and I abide in you, you will bear fruit, much fruit, and fruit that remains, John 15. It's that abiding life, that dwelling life, that indwelling life, uh, dwelling in him internally in your spirit. That's how we bear fruit for God. See, because we already have his love. We already have his joy. We already have his peace. See, if you're struggling with fear and anxiety during this pandemic, worried about the virus, worried about, you know, getting sick or getting dying or whatever, and fear has tormented you, do you realize you already have his peace in you if you're born again? Christ himself is your peace. And all you need to do is go inward to him in, the spirit, in your spirit and begin to draw from his peace. He is your peace. If you don't know what to do in this situation, if you don't know what to do and where this is going and fear has gripped you and you need solutions or answers, do you realize you already have his wisdom inside of you? You already have his mind inside of you? Do you realize that even though you might feel anxious and you might feel like doubt is causing you to be like the winds of the, of the, winds of the, or the waves of the ocean, if you feel that you're being tossed and turned, if you realize that and you realize that he himself is the faith inside of you, you've already got his faith inside of you. We're going to look at that in the next, the next message, but you have already got his faith in you. The faith of the Son of God is inside of you. You don't have to be battered by the winds and the waves. You don't have to be battered by doubt and unbelief, by fear and anxiety. You don't have to be battered about by what am I going to do? What should we do? Where should we go? How's this going to end? You know, where is all this going? That does not have to torment you because Christ is in you. And he himself is your peace, and he himself is your joy, and he himself is your love, is your faith, is your wisdom, is your everything. Everything you need for life and godliness is on the inside of you because Jesus Christ lives inside of you, and your spirit is one spirit with him, glued together, inseparable from the spirit of Jesus Christ. That's what we need to be knowing about during this crisis. Now, there's a lot of other prophetic things God could say and is saying, and they are important, but this is, to me, the tops, is what is he saying more than anything else? Come to me. And our coming to him is not looking up to heaven. I'm not saying never do that, but I'm saying we so look, okay, we go, we pray and we look upward, have you ever thought about how do you come to him? Do you go into a prayer closet? That's part of it. But coming to the Lord is inward right here in your spirit, where your spirit and his spirit are one. It's almost like you just got to get the clutter, the mud, all the, all the things that blur the vision out so that you can see the condition of your spirit is one with him, glued together with him already. See, the problem is not him. The problem is our mind. The problem is we're allowing the soul to dominate and have dominion. The, and we don't have to live like that. You don't have to live defeated. You don't have to live spinning your wills trying to get victory. You don't have to live being overcome. You can be an overcomer. 
And it's not you striving to be an overcomer. It's Christ the overcomer in you living. When you stop living by your life, your soul life, your self life, and then die to that and let Christ in you live, then you can bear fruit for God. Then you can bear that kind of fruit. See, we don't have to let our feelings, our emotions rule anymore. We now have the traction we need to go forward in the Lord. We now have the traction we need to make spiritual progress in him. So I just want to, as we end this message, I just want to encourage you, don't just hear this message and forget about it. Meditate on it often. Meditate on it daily. Just build up a habit of meditating on the, these truths because once you do, your, your life will be totally changed. The mindset on the spirit is life and peace. The mindset on the flesh is death. If you feel like you are dying inside, it's because your mind has been set on the wrong thing. Set your mind on Christ who is in you. Set your mind on what he has done to your spirit. Set your mind on him and you will experience life and peace. Don't let these emotions rule you. These feelings rule you. Let Christ in you be Lord and King. Amen. Amen. We'll stop there and